I'm Steele Wagstaff. I'm here from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, I'll be talking about adding interactivity to web annotation and um, a, a, some, an educational use case that we've been working on for the last couple of years. But first I wanted to start, I think, with a, a couple of expressions of gratitude. Um, I'm thankful uh, to Dan and the Hypothesis staff for putting on this conference. It's been really good to be here, to meet a lot of very interesting people in the last couple of years. I appreciate the, those of you who have presented and shared what you've been doing and how you've been doing it with us in an open and collegial way. And I'm really grateful to all of you for being here when there are so many other really attractive alternatives outside right now. Um, I have uh, also, uh, it's very nice to be back at Fort, Fort Mason. Um, the last time I was here, my wife and I came here on our honeymoon and went to the Long Now, I was saying, and we had a had dinner at Green's. So it's a, a place for a lot of positive, happy memories for me. So it's good to be back here as well. Um, I'm going to talk about five things, and I'll try to, I'm going to do them probably more quickly than you'll want at some points. I'm s sorry for that. The links to the present, this presentation, in, it includes a number of detailed links that you may want to follow and track on your own because I'll be moving more quickly than you may have wanted. And I'm happy to discuss any of this uh, after the presentation or uh, asynchronously on Twitter or elsewhere. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about open textbooks at U University of Wisconsin-Madison as a kind of contextual framing for what we're doing here. How many of you are, 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 act, are um, involved in university teaching of some kind? So a good number, but most of the room isn't, so this is probably going to be helpful context. One, uh, a kind of functional definition for OER or open educational resources. It, this is a definition that comes from SPARC, which is a great consortium of academic research libraries. Um, they are teaching, learning, and research resources that are released under an open license that permits their free use and repurposing by others. In the broad, capacious sense, OER can refer to anything that might be used for learning purposes. There, there are kind of five permissions which inhere in something which is openly licensed. This comes from David Wiley, who is a big, important thinker and, and mover in the open education community. If something is openly licensed, that means that you as a consumer or a user have the permission to retain that content as long as you would like. You don't lose access at the end of the semester, at the end of the year, or even the end of your life. You could pass it on to someone else. Um, you also have the ability to reuse it freely generally, however you like, though in some open licenses have small restrictions on reuse. You have the permission to revise. This is a, a very important distinction, usually from copyrighted materials. So you can alter, edit, and change that material. Uh, you can also combine it with other pieces of openly licensed content, which we refer to as remixing, and you can redistribute it, which means that you can publish, share, give away, make copies of the content that you have. These are really powerful permissions, particularly in the field of education. So there are a number of reasons why we encourage our teachers and those that we care about to use openly licensed materials in education. First is the impact on learning. We now have an enormous body of research with an N of 20,000 or more that show that the impact on learning outcomes is, first, it does no harm. They either stay the same or they sometimes improve slightly. What that shows in many cases is the content that you choose for your course is not as important as the activities or what you are doing, what the learners do to learn. Sorry, publishers, a little bit, but not that sorry. Second, another benefit of choosing open is that the educator or the learner can curate tailor and share those open educational materials to suit their curriculum, and they are free to share those innovations, to give them away, and to collaborate on them with others. The third real benefit, this is for learners, is that students are guaranteed, because it's free and it's uh, an open resource, to have day one access, which is a major problem if you teach at a school and students don't get their financial aid disbursement until the third week and they're three weeks in and they haven't bought the textbook yet because they didn't have the money and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pain. So having day one access is important, but with open educational resources, they also have day one through day infinity access. It's not just day one through the end of the semester or day one through the end of graduation. 
Um, and it, they have the same permissions that you as the author have to edit, remix, revise, customize to suit their own learning needs. And fourth, this is the one that gets touted a lot. Students save money on textbooks. And the reason this gets touted so much is because we have a massive problem. I don't know how well you can see this, but here's some trend lines for a number of um, consumer price indices over the last, just from 2006 to 2016. The black line is the general inflation trend. So this is what's happened with all kind of consumer goods over the time. That blue line, which looks really bad, is the cost of college tuition and fees over the last 10 years. But the really terrifying line, the yellow line, is the consumer price index for college textbooks. In the last 10 years, they've increased over four times faster than the rate of inflation. It's, it's not just a book problem, though, because here's the, the data over the last 20 years. On the top, this is textbook price index. This right here is recreational or consumer books. You'll notice that the cost of books has actually fluctuated a mildly, but diminished over the last 20 years. But the cost of textbooks has increased steadily. If you were to expand this, this uh, series back into the 1970s, you would see a trend of steady, steady growth over 40 plus years. Anyone in the room want to hazard a guess based on your understanding of the principle of economics? how you could have continuous, steady growth like that? Yeah. The textbooks have gotten bigger. That makes them more expensive. Well, books also, some books have also gotten bigger. So that's one partial explanation. The textbooks now are more complex. They're more beautiful. They have expensive features. They cost something to produce. Okay, there may be more demand for textbooks. That may not be a hypothesis that stands up to rigorous scrutiny, <laughs> but that's a good, good guess. Publisher consolidation. That's certainly, we certainly have four or five major publishers that control most of the textbook market, so we may be seeing a cartel effect. Yes? That is, that is one that might stand up to empirical scrutiny, yes? The major one, anybody familiar with the market for pharmaceuticals? So copyright may be one, but oh, so the, person who's, the person who's assigning them or selecting them is not the person who's paying for them. That's the, the major thing that both pharmaceuticals and textbooks have in common. You only have to convince one professor about a required text, and they don't care how much it costs because they don't pay for it. So that, that economic disconnect is probably the primary reason that we're seeing this big driver here. So, Yes, sir. <laughs> Have I solved the problem? Um, I cannot solve the problem, but I can help. If you're a professor, I can help you solve the problem. Yes. Yes. You did. Beautiful. Well, then come on up. <laughs> no, I, we won't do that right now. So there are a couple of things that I want to talk about in, in ways that we are trying to address this problem. Here's one. So the College Board advises that students budget around $1,300 a year for books and materials. But we find in increasing studies of what they actually spend, it's about half of that. They're notoriously cheap, college students. They'd rather use their money to buy beer. Can you believe that? I mean, it's outrageous. But for many of them, that's true. So what's happening? Well, many of them don't buy the required textbooks. Others don't buy the current edition, and others take fewer courses. They take longer to graduate. All of these things are clearly bad for learning. Here's some figures about my home institution. The big number in red is the one I wanted to highlight. This is the average, tip, the typical debt after graduation at a large public institution. Numbers at your institutions or your alma maters may be similar, they may be higher. That's a Somewhat significant number if you consider the scale and number of students we have. So there's clearly a, a problem with student debt that we're aware of in the news. Textbooks are not the main driver of student debt, but they are a part of that. So we have at our campus now uh, an official mission statement, which is right now mainly just a mission statement, but it is a mission statement, and you can read it here. 
We also had a large e-text pilot a couple of years ago that I think failed in some crucial ways, and they're highlighted here. One, the official report said that authors, which were faculty experts, content experts, they wanted to include advanced interactivity and integrate multimedia. But the technologists who were supporting the project just assumed that there would be authoring or editing platforms that would make it possible. We just kind of thought, oh, yeah, we'll have the tools to do that. But they realized through the course of their pilot that the tools they had wouldn't meet the faculty members' expectations. And many of the faculty went away feeling like, oh, either this isn't possible, or I'm going to have to just sit on that idea and accept what it's currently available to me. In my view, as a technologist, that's a major disappointment, and we needed to do better. And so what I did after this was I said, let's write down for me a set of core principles that I think an authoring environment needs to have in order to adopt it and to encourage its use among faculty. So it's published here. You can read the full document. It's long and boring, but it's there. Um, it's on Medium. Number one, I wanted it to be easy to use. I didn't want to have to make everyone's textbooks. I'd like to train you to be able to be an author in about an hour or less. I want it to feel similar to a word processor, since many of our faculty spend a lot of time using those. Second, it needed to be collaborative with robust version control so that you and I and others could collaboratively author this text. And if one of you is a real screw up and deleted my revisions, I could get it back. Three, it was really important that the tool be based on broadly accepted standards so that it could interoperate. Hopefully, they'd be standards that were built and accepted by an open community. I appreciated the talk yesterday, largely focused on standards. It also needed to be device and platform agnostic. I want to support you with whatever uh, computer system you'd like to run, and I don't want to require you to use an app or a certain system to access my tools. And if we really want it to be accessible to all kinds of learners in all kinds of places, it needs to be both compliant with federal accessibility laws and whatever local policies we had for accessibility. The fourth, and this was a big one, I do want it to live on the open web but there are a number of users who don't have reliable access to the internet. So I'd also like to ensure that I can easily export my published web content to non, multiple non-proprietary formats for offload, offline access and viewing. They're getting a little bit more difficult, but these are still the goals that we have, the wish list. Fifth, this is what faculty were telling us. They want to include multimedia. They want to include annotation in the authoring environment, both for the editorial process, but also for the social engagement that we heard about earlier. And they wanted to include interactive learning activities, often contextualized in the text. For example, questions with personalized feedback, largely for formative assessment, sometimes for high-stakes summative assessment, but that's not always a great idea in an open text. And last, uh, there's an acronym that's learning management system. That's the kind of uh, plat the walled garden that people use to teach their courses. It was important for us that each one of these texts be able to live on the open web, to be freely accessible to anyone without a university credential that's just interested in learning about this. But many of our instructors teach college courses. If they adopt and use one of these texts, I want them to be able to use it easily in the course that they teach. And when they use it in that course, I'd like them to have uh, tight integration and the ability to both see some learning analytics and a grade report for various activities if they want it. So that's our big wish list. And I'm here today because we're presenting about having successfully built something that does these six things. We're using an open source publishing tool called Pressbooks as the core engine. It is an online book publishing platform that makes it easy to generate clean, well for formatted books in multiple outputs. It's built on WordPress, so the, the WYSIWYG environment is familiar to many people who've used generic web CMSs. And it is, Pressbooks itself is open source software with a large uh, development community and an open GitHub repository. Some significant features to help you understand it. Uh, Pressbooks itself exists as a WordPress multi-site installation, which means that um, you have a network of federated books or sites that are centrally managed. That's useful for security purposes. It's useful for installing plugins and adding functionality. Each individual book, however, will have a unique URL. And because it's a unique book on the site, it can have a totally distinct theme and appearance. It can have a totally distinct set of permissions. You could publish your book 
in the public domain and I could publish mine as CCBY, someone else, a real jerk, could publish theirs all rights reserved. You could do any number of things. Um, and you can also uh, control permissions and uh, authorial identities at a book level. So you could be an editor in one book and an administrator in another and just simply an author in a third across the network. So it's a nice for kind of centralized control of that. An individual book, however, this is like the landing page for, this is a Portuguese language textbook that we published. You'll have uh, descriptive metadata there at the top that describes what the book is, who the author, the corporate authors are, uh, a short kind of summary description, and then you'll see number three there is the, the particular copyright license that the authors have chosen globally for the book. You can also choose to have a global license and, and a particular license for various parts of the book. So a chapter could have a different license if one of your contributors preferred a different license. Uh, you'll see a cover image. At fourth, you see the different download formats that have been made available for this particular book. Uh, I cut off the screen cap, but it's just EPUB, EPUB, and PDF right now. You could do Mobi. You could do some exotic flavors of XML and things if you wanted. And then you'll have a table of contents and more metadata down below. So every book has a unique landing page with these features. The other things that we were interested in doing first was adding interactive content. And we're doing that primarily in a number of different kind of uh, ways, but primarily I've been really excited about a WordPress plugin built by uh, developers in Norway called H5P, which is also open source and makes HTML5 uh, output. Here's several examples. There's, I think, 40 different interactive content types possible and available through H5P. Here's kind of five genericized examples. One of them is a series of true, false, or multiple choice quiz or question set. Another is a fill in the blanks or word matching activity. Someone was talking about the challenges of doing scansion, uh, teaching scansion and poetry. So for example, we could build an H5P activity, and we have, where you have a poem and students are asked to select all of the stressed syllables. And they would be able to get immediate, real-time feedback about whether a syllable is stressed or unstressed by simply clicking on the words and choosing a stressed or unstressed. You have a kind of uh, image matching. You have to find all the fruits, and someone clicked the, or vegetables, someone clicked the tomato, and the feedback told them, sorry, tomato's a fruit. Uh, you have a drag and drop matching. You also have the ability to do things with media. So we grabbed a YouTube video and we built a series of interactive quizzes into an open YouTube video. As a result of the quiz, you could have them jump to a different point in the video. You could have them proceed somewhere else. And you can have a whole series of these interactions stacked and layered in, in, in context wherever you want in the book. So that was a good first step. The other really sexy thing that we're doing has to do with hypothesis, and it's largely why I'm here right now. We wanted to build the, po the possibility of collaborative annotation. And Hypothesis, thankfully, has a WordPress plugin, which we're able to pull in and use in our Pressbook stack really easily. So here's an example of um, a, a poem that we're teaching by the Wisconsin poet, Lorreen Niedeker. If you haven't read Lorreen Niedeker yet, please do. Uh, and so here would be an example. Like, we've got a little bit of uh, professor context explaining the poem. You have the poem itself, and then we might include like a multi-part post-poem quiz. We also would say in the annotation layer that she makes reference to um, a place called Paw Paw. It's both a tree and a place and all these other kinds of things. It's a real dense, elusive poem. And so first, I've got a little bit of contextual information the professors provided, as well as a picture of a historical marker from the Black Hawk War in Illinois in Paw Paw. A student resp responds and said, I, 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 did, I didn't ever know that. I grew up eating the pawpaw fruit. Here's a video for how to prepare pawpaw. Another student says, oh, I found a bunch of pawpaw recipes. And they post the link to the pawpaw recipes there. And a fourth student says, hey, I found an audio recording of Lorene Niedeker reading a similar poem. And the embedded audio player now lives in the annotation layer. So these are all the kinds of things that were already possible with the annotation layer and helping students understand and discuss and read this poem in a more uh, profound way. The most important thing for the instructor, though, is that this annotation does not interrupt your experience of the poem as an eight-line eight unit. We're not saying read line one and then look at a big image and then read line two and watch this video. We're saying 
the poem there exists in its full integrity and has an optional annotation layer that can be experienced at the user's discretion. The uh, other thing that we're doing, uh, we have a number of professors who are now producing their own uh, anthologies or course readers of material that's in the public domain. Uh, so a Norton anthology light, but free and already delivered in the LMS. So the contextual information the professor's providing, and then they're saying, we also want to have a really rich layer of social conversation or discussion here. And so they would assign the students before they come to class to select a passage and reflect on it, and then they're having a fairly rich conversation about Machiavelli here using an open source, or a, a public domain edition of Machiavelli's The Prince. All these kinds of uses and more are things that we're currently doing now with the tool. But the, the real exciting thing that we wanted to figure out was how can we put annotation, or how can we put these interactive activities into the annotation layer as well? I don't want to just have a quiz in the main body. I'd also like to have these interactive activities live in hypothesis annotation layer. And this is where it gets a little mind-blowing. We, we want to take this whole package, bring it into the LMS, and we want to understand when a learner does something, what did they do and how well did they do it? And so this diagram showing the different pieces that we're using. We have this authoring tool, which has the pieces that I've just shown you. We are then sending a particular kind of learning record, or learning analytic statement into a learning record store, which is an open, this is an open source tool called Learning Locker that we're sending them into. We're publishing the text in context uh, in the learning management system. And then our local developers built another little plugin that goes and looks in the learning record store for an aggregate grade and brings it back to the LMS gradebook if requested. Uh, there's links that explain many of that. Uh, this is a quick slide for how it might look. This book was a series of, say, 30 chapters. They're brought in as a series of, series of structured links into the learning environment. The instructor could then say, between chapter one and chapter two, I built a discussion activity in the learning management system, or I built a quiz, or I built anything else that I want to do. The book is just a backbone or a spine for the course. And when the student clicks on one of those links, they don't leave the LMS. They, it, they think they're loading something in the LMS, but what they're really loading is the published page with hypothesis annotations, the live version of that, in an iframe in the LMS. So it appears to them to be native, but they're really loading the live version of my text. So if I have errata to correct, I correct it once, it's syndicated all of the places that it's embedded instantly. I have a couple of videos showing you the process for instructors and the process for students experiencing that. Um, and here's what it would look like all put together. This is something that we used in a French literature class this last year. You've got a poem like you saw before. We also have these tooltip annotations. So you have a glossary term or a word that's defined. You roll over it, you get a tooltip. It's an unfamiliar French term that's being defined with an accessible tooltip. And over in the annotation pane, this is the piece that I need to thank Robert for, who built a, a, a very hacky fork that lets us do it now. We'd love to move it into core. But we have an H5P quizzing activity that lives in the annotation layer right now. When the student does this, we're sending information about what they're doing. The reason why we're doing this is we want to make this book better for learners. And we don't know what they're doing, how well they're doing, until we start listening for those kinds of things. So I won't go in, in super great detail here, but here's an example of the kinds of statements that we might be gathering in a learning record store. A super quick introduction to the specification. They are JSON triples that follow a basic pattern. Actor, verb, object. So we're just recording a series of actors, actions, and objects, as well as a bunch of contextual information. Every time you do something in one of these activities, we know if we want, if you're in the LMS, we know who you are, what you did, and what the outcome was. Um, you can see the slides for nerdy detail if you'd like it. The final piece that we're doing is trying to build a series of useful visualizations, primarily for the learner and for the instructor. 
If you're a learner and you've just done this activity, how well did you do in aggregate? What were the problems or the questions that you struggled with most? Do they have anything in common? And for the instructor, how many attempts on average did students make on this activity? Was there a question that everybody got wrong on the first attempt? If so, do you need to do a better job of explaining that beforehand? Or should you do a better job following up in lecture afterwards? We'd like to build these useful dashboards based on the data that we're collecting and make it visible in the learning management system for them as well. That one's still very beta e prototypey, but it's our vision. Uh, some future goals. These are things that we'd love to talk with any of you about and work on tomorrow at the hackathon. Right now, we have this hacky customization that lets us put the uh, interactive activity in the annotation pane. We'd like to do that without customization, just natively, like you can put a YouTube video or like you can put a media file. We'd love to be able to put interactive elements in the annotation layer. We'd also like to have the to allow the annotations to be fully expanded by default. There's a single setting right now that's toggled to false, and we'd like to be able to toggle it to true. Hopefully that's a relatively simple fix. Um, we also want to be able to, right now we can clone and copy all of our books. When we clone and copy a book, we'd like to be able to clone and copy the annotations, if desired as well. We think there's a path towards doing that, and we'd like to make sure that we do that well and do it together. Um, a couple of smaller kind of wish lists. And then in the long term, there are two really important things. One is when a student accesses this book in the learning management system, ideally they would just be logged in and authenticated in Hypothesis as themselves. So we would use single sign-on to create an account and make it feel like a seamless experience. And second, there is a a specification for learning activities in the higher education sphere that's called Caliper. It has an annotation profile that describes actor, action, object in a JSON link data form with the controlled vocabulary. We'd love to make sure that when an, a user is making a hypothesis annotation, it's conforming to that specification and we're storing it in our big bucket of, of interoperable learning analytic statements. So those are our kind of long-term goals and visions. We think it's exciting. Uh, we think we can build a stack of tools in, in the open source, in the open community to benefit everyone. Um, and we're excited to do that with you. I think I'm probably out of time, but it's a poem, so I can take another minute, right? OK. Um, I also, as I was coming down here, uh, I, I wrote my dissertation on a group of American poets called the Objectivists. And one of them, uh, George and Mary Oppen, were prominent poets. And they lived just up the street here. You do? OK. So as I was walking down this morning, I stopped. This was their home at 2111 Polk Street. It's currently being destroyed or rebuilt or whatever they say here in creative destruction. Is that the idea? Yeah, OK. Um, Schumpeter, is that who? OK, no. Um, the Oppens lived in San Francisco. And in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, George was writing a series of San Francisco poems. And I wanted to close, because we're near the end of the conference, with these kind of concluding lines from Oppen's San Francisco poems. How shall we say how this happened, these stories, our stories, scope, mere size, a kind of redemption, exposed still and jagged on the San Francisco hills, time and depth before us, paradise of the real, we know what it is, to find now depth, not time, since we cannot but depth, to come out safe, to end well. We have begun to say goodbye to each other and cannot say it. Thanks. Okay, so we're running a little bit late, but we wouldn't want uh, to let Steele escape without a few questions and answers. Uh, does anybody have anything that they want to say other than just profound thanks? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Very engaging talk. You, you're I'm trying to make this quick. So you, you have sort of joined the textbook and the classroom unit as a Thing now that you have annotations in sure. the book. How does that carry over to, um, I mean, how do you deal with uh, separate sections of the class and reusing the book next semester at multiple institutions and sort of squishy overlap question? 
So you can do it a number of different ways. Your question was, how do we deal with different sections of the course? I could use that same press book textbook anywhere I wanted to. However, if you wanted your text to be slightly different, you could simply, it's a, like a very quick two minute routine, you clone the book, you have an identical copy because it's openly licensed, you make whatever edits, revisions, and then you import that into your class. The basic infrastructure and technology would operate exactly the same, um, and the, the configuration would be unique to your course in terms of the gradebook integration and the learning analytics that we're gathering. Those would all be kind of separated by default for your, your school or your, your learning structure, however that was done. So you'd have the option to use the same book or a cloned version, depending on your preference. They're both about as easy as one each other. Yeah. Yes, sir. Wait, wait, can you hold on a second? Okay. I've been working on LMSs, and uh, hey, it's kind of tough. How is this paid for? Um, so which part? Uh, for the students, um, how? Uh, There's no additional cost for students for any of this. Okay. Um, and I've received a total of $1,800 in grant money so far for this, and it was largely done through open source software development communities and then kind of on my own time. This wasn't really officially part of my job description until very recently. So how are the instructors who are kind of creating the content yeah. basically uh, thinking they're paying for it? Or how oh, the instructors who are creating the content are paid for it by the state generally because yeah. they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're subs yeah, that's part of their, for many of them they see it as part of their job to produce learning materials. That's great. Yeah. Others well, don't, and so they don't, or they adopt someone else's, yeah. More questions for Steele? Thanks. Oh. oh. So I edit these books in the WordPress editor you if I wanted to clone them and edit them. Sure, yeah. The Pressbooks has an API for books, and so there's a cloning routine. So you can, you can clone any, any publicly published Pressbook that has a permissive license can be cloned to any other instance of Pressbooks, yes. So are you excited about this new Gutenberg editor in yeah, WordPress? Well, we haven't yet seen how they're going to integrate it into the, I, th I expect that Pressbooks will adopt it, but maybe not at the initial release. But yeah, so we'd be using potentially the Gutenberg editor in place of the old WYSIWYG editor as soon as it becomes a part of core WordPress. Pretty cool. Yeah, we think it will be. Nerve, nerve wracking a little bit. I think they've delayed release a bit, but we'll see. All right, big thanks for Steele.